Hello everyone, how are you? Sean Ferrick here for Trek Culture and I want to say a massive congratulations straight off the bat to our lovely sister channel Who Culture who have gone over the 100,000 subscriber mark. Thank you so much to everyone who likes, shares and subscribes. You know where this is going. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe on every video because you are helping these channels grow immeasurably. We are almost at 250,000 here on Trek Culture and no, that is not me throwing shade at Who Culture, but you know, like... 250,000. But that's not why we're here this week. We are here to go through all of the ups and downs for season three, episode seven, started Lower Decks, a mathematically perfect redemption. This episode is a direct sequel to the season one finale, No Small Parts. We focus almost exclusively on Peanut Hamper, this episode. Now, Peanut Hamper, as you remember, was the not at all reliable exocomp that was introduced as Tendi's sort of buddy slash assistant slash do not ever try and rely on them in a crisis. We see the events of No Small Parts from their point of view in the cold open to this episode. We see the Cerritos being absolutely chopped up to bits by the pack leads. We see, off screen, but sad as it is, the death of Shax. Peanut Hamper even comments on, oh no, the big guy got it. Put an asterisk on that. We'll be coming back to that one in a while. And then the arrival of the Titan. And then Peanut Hamper's like, oh wow, the Titan, that's a real ship. Then, you know, they're about to warp off and Peanut Hamper's like, huh, it's not like they would never scan for non-organic life forms. And away they go. And we get this very kind of melancholy musical theme that plays over the intro. And actually that musical theme for me it's my first up for this week's episode. I thought it was nice. Chris Westlake, again, delivers a bit of a blinder. We're really looking forward to hearing that on the soundtrack. As the episode then starts properly, we see that Peanut Hamper has spent quite a bit of time in this debris field. Enough time, in fact, to build a nacelle with a tiny little deflector dish on it. I have to say, I want to give another little up to the big massive nod to Castaway. You know, in this episode, it's Sophia, whereas in Castaway, it is, of course, Wilson. Yeah, I liked that because it actually helped us to kind of continue along the idea of exocomps being sentient. Because if we go all the way back to the Next Generation episode, The Quality of Life, we remember that the whole point of that was that they had achieved sentience. Now this is taken up and dialed up to the extreme, of course, in no small parts. But here, the other side of sentience, the need for companionship, is highlighted in the character of Sophia. There is a but. I have a down, and it's going to be a bit of an issue for this whole episode, because my down is Peanut Hamper. I have several reasons for this. We're not really supposed to root for Peanut Hamper. As we discover, as the episode goes on, long story medium, Peanut Hamper did not quite have the character growth that we had hoped. The problem with that is that you have an entire episode where your focus character is entirely one-dimensional. And that, to me, it was an issue because, oh, we don't really have that in Lower Decks. To have this character where your entire point of view character, your entire focus, is someone you're not rooting for, uh, and someone where there's maybe a few minutes where you think, okay, okay, maybe there has been a bit of a growth here. But Peter Hamper was so thoroughly unlikable up to that point that even the growth before the bait and switch isn't really enough to turn it around. So for example, when the Druckmanni arrive and they're here to steal the debris and nearly in fact steal the nacelle, what does Peanut Hamper do? Straight away having gone, Sophia, we're ride or die for life. Sophia, see you later, only room for one. Okay, so, right, however long it's been in space, we know that up to that point, Peanut Hamper hasn't learned or grown in any way. Oh, okay, so we're doing this. All right, well look, hey, Open mind, open mind, open mind. Peanut Hamper ends up crashing on the planet of Ariolus, home to the Ariors, who are, to quote Peanut Hamper herself, a poor man's Aurelian. The Aurelians were introduced all the way back in the animated series as effectively large bird-like members of the Federation. And there is a lot of crossover here, but these are, these seem a bit closer to Birdman from Rick and Morty, which I, I'm, I'm here for, I do enjoy our references, that's all good, but they're, seemingly 
a technological less advanced race and peanut hamburger is effectively magic from the sky. Now again, even that comes with a little bit of a, a bait and switch later on, but we kind of get this idea of a knight in King Arthur's court. You know, you have seemingly person from the future or person with knowledge from the future arrives back in time. And rather than, rather than in any way try and blend, which again, I realize exocomp, not exactly like she can stick on a pair of wings and be like, oh no, I'm totally one of you. I do understand that, but there is, uh, there seems to be too much done on the, I'm too cool for school, I'm over this. And again, it just made her thoroughly unlikable. Rude to her new friends. Well, obviously not her new friends, but you know, the people trying to befriend her. It was a frustrating episode in that respect, I must say, um, because although they do hang a lampshade on it later on and Peanut Hamper goes, huh, I guess I haven't been breaking the Prime Directive this whole time. She's breaking the Prime Directive that whole time. Like, remember, she is an ensign in Starfleet. She's not a particularly good ensign in Starfleet. And, you know, she does reference the fact that, like, yeah, Starfleet's probably going to arrest me if they find me because, you know, I went AWOL. You know, she clearly didn't pay attention to a single moment of her academy training because, like, yeah, the Prime, the, the prime Directive, it's fairly prime. So to see such clear flouting of it, even as played for comedy as it is, I'm not trying to be a party pooper or a spoil sport here, although I realize that's probably how I'm coming across. It just didn't really work for me. There is a seeming love story and she's able to... Okay, actually, one thing I am giving an up to right now, which I did get a proper laugh out of this. Everything on the planet has wings. When one of them is bitten by a sky snake, she asks, well, if everything has wings, why is it... Why is that one called a sky snake? Wouldn't it just be called a, a snake? And I have to say, I did find that quite funny. Oh, I am about to shuffle off into the night. Oh, I'm the end of it. And she's like, oh, okay, hyperspray. This is where we, we, we play on the idea of, you know, advanced technology versus seemingly less advanced technology. And, you know, they're like, oh, oh, okay, this is cool. Much as I did enjoy it, and it does lead to, again, a seeming thawing of a relationship between Peanut Hamper and the rest of the Ariors, this is kind of also frustrating because, first of all, they were going to let that guy die. That's fine. That's their business. They have chosen not to bother using technology in their lives. That's grand. But then they all look at her as if she is the second coming. They had access to that technology as it's revealed. And they look at her like, oh my God, she's amazing. She's wonderful. She saved his life. Is she wonderful for getting around the rules? The, the main story of the episode with Peanut Hamper being the anti-hero just didn't work for me. It just didn't work. When you have the opening credits and you seem to be following this lonely character out in space, you don't realize you're kind of being set up to follow a bit of a, a villain, especially when that beautiful music plays over it. Oh, 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 hold on, I'm getting a call. We now go live to Cannon Watch. <laughs> Hello, Sean, and welcome to Cannon Watch. I am, of course, Sean with the Federation News Network. There is breaking news being revealed in this episode. Peanut Hamper flying through that debris field. You see Samantha Rutherford's original head implant. We saw quite recently that Rutherford still lives with his dichotomy inside his mind of who he was versus who he is and this secret thing that was put inside his brain. Where was it placed? Was it in the device itself, which is floating beside a star? Or was it in Rutherford, somewhere deep down, something psychological? And if that is the case, what was the point of the implant? We are now faced with this massive question of what was the point of having the implant there at all? If the implant is the one with the program, we understand. But this suggests it's something much deeper, something much more sinister, something about a conspiracy. Back to you, Sean. Honestly, that guy is never happy unless he gets to discuss like three or four different conspiracy theories every week. Uh, but it's actually a very good point. Which also actually leads me to another point. Complete lack of Rutherford this week. And in fact, I'm going to give a down to the lack or improper use 
of our main Cerritos cast this week. Quite frankly, and I, I do not begrudge giving someone time off in the way that we will never give Chris time off, but it's been like everyone had the week off. Because you would have thought that a story about Peanut Hamper would feature Tendi, for example. And yes, she effectively cameos. And there is a line from Mariner where we're receiving a distress call from Peanut Hamper. You know, and Boimler pinpoints the location. and That's their involvement. And Rutherford is only there in face only. And y'all know how I feel about non-vocal cameos. In fact, adding it down, don't tease me with Miggly Moo. And especially, Miggly Moo, coming from an avian background, you would have thought would probably play quite a large role in an episode like this. And not using Miggly Moo, but having him there on the bridge, that was, that was a bit of a, a, a missed opportunity. Now, listen, I am not saying that only avians can be in stories about avians. I think, I think I'm safe in, in saying that. No, I just like, if you've given us a character who is avian, and you then go to a planet with aliens. Does it not possibly... No? Just me? All right, just me. So yeah, so a, a couple of quick downs there. We're kind of for, for the lack of use of main cast. And now, the reason it bugs me is because if you compare it to a previous Cerritos Light episode, for example, Three Ships, which was done brilliantly. So, I mean, yes, you did have... A, a much lighter use of the Cerritos crew, but then the way they used the Klingon Bird of Prey and the Vulcan ship with Tillin, where the hell is she? That was a that that was a way of doing it really really well. Here it was it was like, oh wait no we've got to we've got to include the Cerritos, and, and so they did. Now I, I being very very harsh, I think really what hurt this episode outside of the peanut hamper character was where it came in the season see last week yeah i mean i've just about calmed down from last week's episode just a little bit just just, just a little bit and so suddenly you're, you're then faced with this one and whether this was a conscious decision of right we we hit the high of uh, episode six let's let's bring it down let's calm down you know let's do something different for episode seven and i do appreciate the you know I, I appreciate the episodic nature of it we love episodic nature we've discussed this many many times this is like an episode two or three you know not that episodes two or three are of lower quality it just stands out like a sore thumb if if if, if i'm honest we had a very unlikable main character we had really, really low use of the Cerritos crew, and this coming off the back of what's probably one of the best episodes of Lower Decks overall. That combination really hurt the episode this week. Now, the story of the episode as played, because there's not an awful lot of story, um, is, you know, Peter Hamper, she, you know, begins to acclimatize. These people both are technological, but they aren't because they've chosen to not use it, but she actually hasn't broken the Prime Directive. Okay, that's fine. And then the Drukmani appear out of nowhere. Oh, up. Oh. J.G. Hertzler reprising his role from Moist Vessel from season one. Always good fun. Actually, we can use this technology. <laughs> they do arrive. And the first thing they say, which I appreciate, is like, oh, hey, like, don't worry about us, I know you're not using that stuff, so we're just going to take it, we'll leave you in peace. It's actually not that bad of a... Not that bad of an offer, really. Uh, it is soundly rejected. Their, their cutting beams do tend to destroy the uh, Arior's planet, so that's not good. They tease this whole relationship between Peanut Hamper and Rauda, and it's funny... Oh, by the way, a, a good best guest performance from Harry Shum Jr., who I remember from Glee. There's no, there's no stakes at all in this episode. You know, you have the Drogmani are, you know, carving this place to bits. Suddenly, Rauda is piloting the ships, which really reminded me of Sona battleships, against them. And then, you know, the Drogmani, they take over one of the ships. They're given the Cerritos an absolute pasting in orbit. Must be Tuesday. And none of it feels like any of it matters. I know. I'm sorry. I, I You know, you're kind of going, Sean, Sean, did you wake up on the bad side of bed today? Perhaps I did. There is some saving graces. The reveal, of course, that Peanut Hamper was the one who actually called the Drukmani to come to the planet and get her off the world. The reason I think I'm as negative about this episode as I am was that reveal. Now, because, so the, the, the journey 
that we would have liked to have seen Peanut Hamper go on was revealed in this moment to be a complete farce. None of it was real. Peanut, all Peanut Hamper was doing was just getting off the uh, getting off the world. Had it been handled in any other remote way, I think I would have been more on board with it. But I do like the way the Druckmanni revealed. It's like, oh, well, it was you the whole time. You contacted us. But instead, they relied on that incredibly unlikable character version of Peanut Hamper, which was, oh, God, I hate this so much. Oh, I'm so over everything. Everything is so terrible. Blah, 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 blah. This is such a terrible planet. So it's like, it's not even a compelling villain. It's just annoying. It looked very nice. I very much enjoyed the design of the episode. The Ariors looked good. Um, there was absolutely no reason for Rodan to be at Rodan, Rodan. Oh, 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 is this, is this a reference? Am I just getting this right now? There's no reason at all for Rodan to be as ripped as he is. And yes, why not? Why not? It's like Birdman got an upgrade. And I'm totally on board with that. There's definitely, of course, they play on this idea of it being like a like an Ewok village almost. You know, you're up in the skies, it's all very agrarian. And, you know, I'm on board with that. It just sort of didn't go anywhere. And then even toward the end, with this reveal, like, oh, we're just we're just gonna leave. We're just gonna leave the planet then. Alright, that's fine. So it on it was the episode was filler. You probably knew that this was coming, but my trellium down for the week was basically Peanut Hamper's entire story and character. I just, I just couldn't get behind it this week. But not to leave us on a low note, I am going straight to an up, and I think you knew that this was coming, is the cameo by Jeffrey Combs, The Return of Agamus. There is that stinger at the end where Peanut Hamper is locked away in the Daystrom Institute with all the other megalomaniac type computers and who is her cell partner or next door neighbor? It's Agamus. I would be the first one to tell you, don't put anyone beside Agamus. Don't put nothing, like lock Agamus in its own like solitary confinement place. And yet, okay, fine. If there is a sting, I wouldn't mind seeing now another episode of Agamus. I think I'm okay with Peanut Hamper. I will say that. But yeah, like that was fun. That was a good sting at the end because again, Jeffrey Combs being Jeffrey Combs, definitely my trellium, uh, trellium? My latinum up. Jeffrey Combs as Agamus. Thank you so much. The uh, Basically one of the only reasons that's beating out poor LJG for latinum up, who is wonderful as well. And as muddled and as sort of like, mm, as it sounds, I'm afraid that's kind of it. I mean, the story is, wafer thin this week the the, the main character are completely unlikable um it seems to be the whole episode is just setting up that gag of now you've got peanut hamper and agamus might be off to create some havoc and if that's the case look i'm here for it but i didn't need to spend 25 minutes watching a setup for that gag so that to me is why i've been so down on this week's episode having said all of that it wouldn't be in ups and downs without a visit to Cetacean Observations. Now, of course, Peanut Hamper themselves is a callback to season one. We have Rutherford's original headpiece. That begs a question. Peanut Hamper, in that cold open, actually comments on the fact that Shax dies in that explosion. Now, we have obviously watched the, the jokes and the japes at, you know, the Black Mountain and everything and Shax coming back from the dead. Peanut Hamper, when Shax beams down, doesn't even mention it. Like, there's, there's no reference to the fact of like, shouldn't you be dead? Down. There is a reference to Free Cloud, which was introduced in Star Trek Picard, and she says she wants to be a Dabo girl. Now there is the Druckmanni from Moist Vessel, with of course the Druckmanni commander from Moist Vessel as well. There is a shout out to the fact that the Ariors are a poor man's Aurelians. There is a reference to the Borg, to which Peanut Hamper says, oh, I'm gonna contact the Borg. Yeah, you're all gonna get so assimilated. Mm, you won't like that, will you? We have the wonderful Agamus, 
We have, of course, the return of the Daystrom Institute, looking as it did in Star Trek Picard. And of course, there was that robot that's two down from Agamus. Two down, one down. Anyway, the CBS logo that's sitting there as well. And that brings me up to the end of this video. I'm afraid it was it was Lower Decks Light this week. Um, look, when I say that, you know, this wasn't the best episode, at least it's Lower Decks. At least, you know, it's kind of, it was still, there was still laughter in it. It was still enjoyable. I just didn't like the character and didn't particularly love the story. So this might be another one that, you know, when I'm doing my rewatch of Lower Decks, I might probably jump over this one. Having said that, Jeffrey Combs, Hard to tell, hard to tell. I am really curious now. So this might be the most negative I think I've been about an episode of Lower Decks. What did you think about it? Let me know in the comments below because I'm really, really curious. And of course, don't forget to get in touch with us over on Trek Culture Twitter as well. And you can get myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter and at Sean.Ferrick88 on Instagram. As of release of this, we've got the Star Trek Universe panel is coming up this weekend at New York Comic Con. So do make sure to stay keeping an eye on all of our socials because we are going to be going through all of the releases that are going to come out from that panel. That's going to be this Saturday at 9 p.m. Uh, UK Irish time, 4 p.m. No, Eastern time. Everyone, thank you so much for watching as always. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I have said it before, I'll say it again. You are wonderful. Our friends in Ukraine, stay strong. It's a very trying time. It's a very dark time at the moment. Please stay strong, please stay safe and know that we are with you. To our friends in Iran, your bravery is incredible. Please, please know that we are behind you 110%. Everyone, look after yourselves until I see you again. Make sure that you live long and prosper. If you are gonna have some lovely weekend plans, make sure they're awesome. Make sure you have the best time. Make sure you make it so. Thanks very much.